I'm very pleased and honored to introduce my dear friend and colleague, co-regent in my class of regents for the last eight years, Dr. Scott Levin. Dr. Levin is the Paul B. Magnuson Chair of Orthopedics, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, and tenured professor of surgery in the Division of Plastic Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Scott. Steve, it's great to see you and great to be with you. Uh, a lot of activity in our in our house of surgery the last couple months uh, and big issues ahead of us, uh, both socially and medically. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I think we've probably seen each other more since the beginning of this pandemic than we normally do in a given year uh, when we're not traveling in different directions, but it's unfortunately not in a person-to-person -person contact sense. Yeah. It's, it's with these virtual contacts. But, uh, you know, the, the fact of uh, it's my good fortune to see you and many of our other regents and the leadership in the college, the incredible uh, staff that is in the College of Surgeons led by Dave Hoyt. And um, although I represent uh, and practice two specialties, orthopedics and plastic surgery, limb salvage, limb reconstruction, hand surgery, uh, you know, I have interest in, uh, in allo transplantation. Um, I leave my uh, specialty, uh, specialty guns, if you will, at the door, and I uh, am really have been enamored with the College of Surgeons in terms of what it represents to organize medicine. I don't know if you can see in the back, but on my wall of my mentors in the top right corner is Dave Saviston, who I trained under at Duke, and he sort of appointed me to my first uh, faculty position uh, in uh, Actually, it was uh, 1991, so I'm starting my 30th year of practice. And what the College of Surgeons has done uh, during COVID has been nothing short of um, a miracle. Um, rapid organization of all the um, different factions of the college to engage uh, surgeons in every community, rural surgeons, those that took the onslaught, like our colleague Fabrizio Michelazzi right in New York City, other New York surgeons, uh, we were affected significantly here in Philadelphia. And even though, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a specialist, as you pointed out, my colleagues in orthopedics, in plastic surgery, in neurosurgery, were glued to the special COVID newsletter that was instituted by Val Roosh an idea from Val Roosh, our distinguished president, who all of us know practices at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. And that became the roadmap of how we develop our ramp down practices, how we look at ramp up, how we evaluate patients in the unit, unit how we redeploy our educational uh, programs and our residents. So if ever in recent decades, the college has had a remarkable profiling, well-deserved because of its uh, strength and exercising its strengths uh, carefully, it's been during the COVID crisis. And I've been really a proud, proud with you uh, to be part of this. And uh, the, the comment I'll make about this is I feel that so many calls from orthopedic colleagues, plastic college, colleagues around the country not asking me what we're doing here at Penn, but asking, you know, you're a region of the college, you're our orthopedic uh, region, uh, you're the vice chair of the regents. What is the College of, college of Surgeons saying about A, B, C, and D? And we had that information, as you know, in a matter of hours, we were producing uh, peer review uh, papers from high impact journals. Uh, we were canvassing people in action on the front lines, what they were dealing with. And so the, the underpinnings of the College of Setting Standards and Safe Delivery of Care, I think we've never had uh, more prominence of those two attributes as we've had during COVID. Well, we've certainly enjoyed them under your leadership as Vice Chair of the Board of Regents and, and the leadership of Beth Sutton as the Chair of the Board of Regents, Val Roosh, you've already mentioned, and Dave Hoyt, you've already mentioned. And, I think that quartet of tremendous leaders has inspired all of us to ensure that we're doing the best we can every day. As we do it together, and as we all leave our guns at the door, so to speak, 
perhaps you could talk about some of the ways that the ACS brings together the House of Surgery, the 85,000 surgeons. You, you spoke about the COVID, the ACS COVID-19 newsletter, but the COVID pandemic, I wouldn't say is over, it's morphing. Uh, going forward, hopefully at some point, it, it won't be the same magnitude, but the college still has that role as the convener, the, mm. you know, bringing together the surgical coalition and certain activities, perhaps you could touch upon advocacy and healthcare policy uh, or, or quality programs that are of interest, not just to orthopedists, plastic surgeons, hand surgeons, neurosurgeons, but to ophthalmologists and ENT surgeons, and gynecologists and others who are a part of the constitu constituency that we represent. Yeah, well, I think now more than ever, with COVID being the enzyme or the catalyst that starts to really meld the house of surgery together, let's take advocacy, okay? Fighting for appropriate um, funding for physicians, for physician workforces, for the, the employees in physician practices, um, you know, now during COVID, and then the extraordinary efforts by Pat Bailey and Frank Opelka and our, our Washington uh, colleagues uh, trying to, on both sides of the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats, to uh, make the case for surgeons, for surgery, uh, and as uh, many people know in the college, but our, our surgical colleagues in every discipline across the country may not know how hard that Frank and, and the advocacy people are working to sort of stem the uh, movement to decrease surgical fees, you know, across the board cuts, Steve, I guess in colorectal, maybe three to 4%, five to 6% perhaps in, uh, in various aspects of orthopedic, sort of trying to rebalance the books with primary care. And we've heard this, uh, heard about this issue before, but it's pending. And it's, it's coming to uh, a head, if you will. And so the college, on top of everything else, has been working in advocacy. Uh, I say to my orthopedic colleagues, let's not forget when the two-room issue came up in, in Boston, uh, in Massachusetts. Who was there? The College of Surgery. Who's been there when we talk about surgical garb and, 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 and the skull caps and what to wear in the operating room? The, the, the ability of the uh, college, and this is a word that came up on our regential call, as you recall, the reach of the College of Surgeons, the prowess of David Hoyt in organized medicine, whether it's the American Hospital Association or uh, political action groups or JCO or, or CMS for that matter, we have a strong reach. And at this point in the history of surgery, um, the college certainly is a premier educational organization. It's provided education, whether it's been CSAP uh, or other uh, continuing education courses uh, for surgical leaders, uh, for ultrasound, all the things that you do in colorectal surgery has been front and center. But I think the college now is morphing to um, at least a strong, if not stronger, advocacy platform where the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is entertaining the dialogue. We had David Teague, who was our president a couple of years ago, came to Washington to 20F Street to have a several hundred people there on remember the quality and the safety uh, Congress that we, we had a couple summers ago. Uh, the college is who people are now looking towards for leadership in these areas. And I think it's our obligation to uh, circle the wagons and get the other surgical specialties um, better in, informed and apprised of what we're doing on their behalf. We do a lot for the House of Surgery. I'm not sure through our Board of Governors, uh, certainly through the regions, but our Board of Governors may not be in touch with everything we're doing. And now's a critical time in American healthcare delivery. Uh, and I will mention, because I think it's um, an area that ne deserves now our attention. The college has put out a very uh, strong statement on the social issues, social issues affecting our country, um, the um, issues uh, with uh, healthcare disparities that LD Britt has gotten NIH funding to study, but now more than ever, based on what's happened in our cities, our police force, um, we need to do more in that domain 
And that's going to be a responsibility of every surgical discipline, not just the College of Surgeons, but who is poised to convene, uh, to embrace the American College of Surgeons, in my opinion, Steve. Thank you, Scott. I, I completely agree with, with everything you've said. The uh, ACS is the House of Surgery. It is the voice of surgery. And the fact that during the recent COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we did the things you alluded, getting the American Hospital Association, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, ARN, 23 surgical societies and the coalition together is a feat that few others could do, if any others mm -hmm. could do. So somebody listening to our discussion might think, I want to get involved. Hopefully they do think, how can I get involved? As a young person, a young faculty member in a subspecialty, and I don't mean colorectal, we've done general surgery training for the full time, but one of the other areas, ENT, ophthalmology, orthopedic, neurosurgery, uh, plastic surgery, how, how does somebody get involved? Well, I think, you know, um, I've always been impeccably proud of being a FACS fellow of the American College of Surgeons, again, we go back to our mentors, those that trained us, those that held up the college, at least in my personal history, Steve, it was Dave Sabiston and the environment of Duke surgery, um, Dave Sabiston, then, then Bob Anderson, uh, and Danny Jacobs, and then Alan Kirk. Uh, you know, Dr. Sabiston was president of the college. And so it was important uh, that we represented our institutions. And by representation, I mean the rural surgeon, the privademic, if there is such a term in, in South Florida, uh, the big institutions like Penn or Cleveland Clinic. There's something there for everyone. And so the rhetorical question of young people is what's in it for me? What is the value of the college? The answer is um, identity, advocacy, the opportunity indeed to get involved in so many areas of healthcare delivery, optimal patient care, our, our, our so-called dropsy committee is all encompassing. It's not the general surgeon. And the problems globally in surgery today are everyone's problem, reimbursement, uh, tort reform, uh, education, changing educational paradigms, board certification, maintenance of certification. You say, no, wait a second, Scott, aren't there boards in neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery? They have their own boards. What, what do they want to have to do with the college? And the answer is whether it has to do with organizing your CME through a central platform. Those of us that attend the college, you know, have CME uh, that we can acquire from the college. And again, look at our recent history over the last several months of all the things the college has done for organized surgery and will continue to do. And I would honestly say in advocacy, uh, you know, if, you, if you're giving money to a political action group, uh, the college uh, is an, an outlet for that if you're intended to give. Most people give and, and are segregated right into their specialty society, the orthopedic political action group. The general surgeons have a political action group. But I think we have a big opportunity now to unite surgery, just do the math. Just do the math. You mentioned 83,000. We have approaching 30,000 orthopedic surgeons, maybe eight to 10,000 or 9,000 plastic surgeons. You're now well over into 100, 125,000. I haven't included my brothers and sisters in ENT and ophthalmology. Our oral surgery colleagues, I think there are 2,000 or 2,500 oral surgery colleagues that I spoke to on a webinar. Um, arranged uh, by uh, uh, my colleague here, uh, Naraj Pandya, asked me to speak. We had, I don't know, 1,500 oral surgeons on the webinar finding out about what, the, what is the college saying about um, surgery during COVID. And so, uh, again, I think we have found new common ground, education, advocacy, some nuances of practice. Certainly, who's not interested in um, protecting fair and adequate um, reimbursement and continuing optimization of value in surgery. Who are the leaders in that? The College of Surgeons is. While other organizations are in that space, Steve, the quality programs, TQIP, the pediatric programs, NISQIP, are exemplary for all of surgery. You know, orthopedic surgery, for example, has some registries. 
plastic surgery has registries in breast cancer. Breast cancer is a, uh, a health, uh, health problem, right? It affects our radiation oncology problem partners, our, our uh, medical oncologists, reconstructive surgeons, the general surgeon who does breast, uh, breast centers, all that's measured. We want to do the best for our patients. And so to have those kind of quality programs create an enormous value. And each surgeon in the United States touches quality, right? They touch safety and they're trying to deliver value. So if I, I look at quality, safety, value, College of Surgeons is probably the best place to study those, to get involved in those particular issues, either directly or as a template for how individual surgical specialties could do this work. You know, you're a colorectal surgeon. You know, I know you um, are not only eminently respected all over the world, but you've involved, been involved in international trials. There's not one person in general surgery that my friend Steve Wexner doesn't know, but the reach, your reach, and bringing that reach back to the college has influenced how well we've responded to COVID, uh, how well we've ramped up and ramped down surgery. Uh, and you're, you're a distinguished region, but people such as yourself who have that reach, we have John Atkinson in neurosurgery. We have Jim Gigantelli. These are household names in their surgical specialties, and yet they're pulling all these specialties into the regential room and policy and so I think this back and forth dialogue, we've had a lot of discussions with Ron Weigel, who's directing our governors. There are a few hundred governors that sit in there representing every uh, sort of surgical, especially from hand surgeons to breast surgeons, to colorectal surgeons, to trauma surgeons. You know what I'm talking about, and I hope your list, our listeners do. And so that's a very powerful uh, group of individuals within the college that again, create that reach that sort of uh, ecosystem of surgery. That's not just domestic, it's global, it's international. How much did you learn from uh, Antonio Lacey and our colleagues uh, in mainland China? Penn Orthopedics, for example, had a grand round about five weeks ago with our friends from Wuhan, China. The orthopedic surgeons there talking to us on platforms like this. So, you know, as we go towards what sounds like a virtual meeting in October for the Congress, what would be a better opportunity for specialists such as orthopedic surgeons, ophthalmologists to tune in? Let them hear the Martin lecture. Let them hear Dave Hoyt for an hour talk about what the college has done. Uh, we're in a new, new direction and it's all encompassing and inclusive and I'm excited about our future. Thank you so much for sharing all these fantastic thoughts. It's always energizing and invigorating to talk to your enthusiasm is infectious in a good way. Uh, and I'm absolutely confident that anybody who's been watching us today, who's not a fellow is gonna figure out how to apply to be a fellow. And we those need them. People, yeah, and those people who are fellows are gonna go on it involved in leadership so they can work with you and the others like you who you've mentioned and some who time doesn't permit us mentioning. So thank you very, very much. And you, my friend, thank you for the opportunity. Be well. Be well, <laughs> stay well. Look forward to seeing you in person one day.